Good evening, everyone. I hope uh, you have all kind of enjoyed uh, the sessions and discussions uh, so far. Uh, I would like to welcome again, on behalf of Dan and Best Street, all our esteemed panelists, uh, Belfer, uh, Parveen, Aditya, and Sanjay. Uh, thank you so much for taking this time out. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've been talking about top 500 value creators, and there is this immense contribution that these top 500 value creators uh, make. Uh, they touch about 34% of the country's GDP they influence. Uh, and moving forward, as, uh, as the time is changing, according to the Amrit Kal vision, uh, you know, the country is expected to become a developed con country and our GDP is kind of expected to grow many leaps and bounces. And for that, uh, these companies will ha have a major role uh, to play. We have seen and we have heard discussions around three key pillars uh, we plan today. Uh, so to begin with, you had a panel discussion around innovation and processes. Uh, next up, you had a panel discussion around technology and dis dis disruption. And another uh, key pillar, uh, you know, towards driving growth is leadership. So this particular panel has uh, uh, the topic which is around uh, leadership is in next growth era, and I'm delighted to have all of these panelists here. Uh, and when I was sitting with them uh, in an ice-breaking session, uh, most of these people are homegrown leadership in their respective uh, organizations, and all of these are very, very trusted, reputed, uh, and innovative organizations. So I'm, I'm really, really, it's my pleasure to be with you all here. So just to start the discussion around, you know, the kind of adaptiveness which is required uh, for the leadership today, uh, uh, that's the first track of the discussion, and I'll, I'll come to you, uh, uh, Balfour, uh, for, with the first question. Uh, India is seeing a shift in leadership dynamics with growing focus on sustainability, digital transformation, and innovation. How do you define uh, leadership excellence in today's corporate India? Uh, what key traits uh, should a leader possess today? Hello. So thank you very much. Uh, right question to us. We are in the middle of uh, change. Uh, much said cliche changes the constant and the diverse uh, customer base, the reach that we have, 55,000 locations, uh, much relevant to your question. So I think to answer your question of, uh, you know, I think being a visionary is the first, uh, first quality, uh, ability to craft a story which brings in the transformation, the sustainability, then the transformation in business growth. That's the first quality that I would expect a leader to have today. Uh, the other thing is I, I read a book, I think the fifth principle, not now, uh, maybe 15, 20 years ago, and that talked about systems thinking, you know? It's a crazy thought. It's about a bumblebee that flies in Australia, does it, impact the typhoon in Indonesia. You know, it's that. So everything that falls into, so having a holistic perspective, having a system thinking ability, uh, those are two major things uh, that, uh, you know, the other thing is keep the main thing the main thing. Uh, there are lots of frills around. Uh, so if you can keep the relevance to the main thing, those are three things I would take home, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Bal, for very valid uh, uh, traits. Uh, I come to you, Sanjay, uh, with the same question. Uh, yeah, hi. See, when we talk about digital transformation, IT technology, to me, they are synonyms to agility. They are synonyms to responsibility in terms of resilience and being able to embrace the change. And when we talk about sustainability, it is conducting yourself in a responsible manner. 
So how does it impact and what traits should the leadership team practice or possess? Allow me to talk through the examples that I am trying to pursue at PDS. So for us, we are a 25-year-old company, but we always call ourselves as 25 years old startup because there is so much changing around us. We are a federation of entrepreneurs. PDS has 110 offices in 22 countries, 12,000 people, only 33 in India in the head office. The rest are all outside. Every business head is an entrepreneur with an equity in the PNL he or she is running. So we are a federation of entrepreneurs. Therefore, we are somewhere achieving the objectivity of agility and the speed with which I can respond to the changes. You know, in the previous presentation, we heard about AI bringing a change. Am I, from a leadership conduct perspective, prepared for that? Second thing is, you know, uh, Belfer, you asked me, Sanjay, what does PDS stands for? I say people driving success. We are a people first organization. Every employee in PDS owns a PNL. We have a very comprehensive incentive structure whereby somebody who is a procurement person, merchandiser in Bangladesh, he or she knows I'm buying so much of fabric. This is how much it is contributing to my PNL. Therefore, if I save so much money for the organization, this is my incentive structure. So it is people who are driving success. When I talk about circularity and sustainability, we all hear about companies contributing 1%, 2% of PAT to the CSR agenda or sustainability agenda. We allocate 6% of our capital employed. You know, after oil, apparel is being talked about as a sector. That is where PDS belong to, garments. You know, we have a strong impact on the environment. Now, after the end of season sale, the garments will get into a landfill. You know, they'll get into a landfill and get spoiled. We invested into a technology whereby there is a gentleman called Jack in Poland. He said, give me those garments. I will take it to Africa. I will take it to a price point wherein still it can be bought. There is a gentleman called Barry, a 71 year old in Nottingham, 71 years old. He said, Sanjay, I have a technology. I will, when the garments are ready to be crushed, I will mix them into a chemical and I will make anti combustible bricks. So what I'm trying to tell you is that let us conduct ourselves in terms of ox structure, in terms of motivation of people, in terms of how we are contributing and practicing, you know. It's like you can give them a fish that will feed them for a day. But if, if I am able to tell my team how to fish, do fishing, then I'm kind of enabling them for all years to come. That's probably the change that the leadership need to bring in in terms of traits that one need to possess for embracing the change. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, that's really good to hear. And of course, uh, it's a very, very uh, innovative org structure that PDS has. Uh, and structure uh, of the organization gentlemen, is one of the key, uh, one of the six key levers uh, that uh, a company or a corporate could utilize to drive growth in this next growth era. Uh, and if I get time, I'll, I'll speak to you about the other five uh, key levers as well. Uh, but sticking to uh, the leadership and the adaptiveness of the leadership, let me go to Aditya now, asking you about how has the leadership evolved and adapted technology and sustainability in real estate sector, Aditya? Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mukesh, for this uh, question. Uh, because uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, it is an evolving phase, right? And real estate is, is not just a building. Uh, it, has, it has moved much beyond uh, that. Uh, the entire curve towards real estate is towards maturity, and uh, it is aided by aspects like AI, digitalization, uh, sustainability, and others. Uh, if, if, if I were to look at uh, real estate as an industry, uh, we see the technology changing every few months, right? And, and hence, in that scenario, it would be safe to assume uh, that uh, uh, the, the business or the real estate industry uh, is primarily driven uh, to a large extent by technology and data just as any other business. If, if I were to, and, and your question was, in this, in this rapidly changing um, uh, industry, 
how is how is GLL uh, adapting it and, and how leadership has been changing around AI and sustainability. Uh, GLL uh, having a history and a legacy of over 200 years globally uh, and in India, uh, we this is our 26th year. Uh, uh, and just, just on a separate note, uh, there, we, we have a vertical uh, uh, called uh, PDS as well. Right, and it's called Project Development Services, but I really like uh, people driving success. Uh, maybe, maybe something that we will uh, take away uh, year from, but, but getting, getting back to the main uh, aspect, in the last 26 years, and I have been a part of this firm for 19 years, right? And I can safely say uh, how uh, we have been evolving to the changing trends in this uh, industry. Uh, eventually today, and, and if I just compare the last, last three to four years, um, uh, today, uh, uh, our, our clients are able to view their residential apartments uh, through an app uh, sitting anywhere in the world. Uh, we are able to showcase uh, our clients' sites, which earlier they used to travel from all across the world to look at it uh, uh, through uh, digitization and, and virtual reality. Uh, eventually, uh, predictive analysis is a huge part of the construction that we do, and it has not only helped us to uh, uh, become agile and, and more sustainable to the point that you were making, but also, also uh, bring a lot of efficiency uh, on, onto this. Today, uh, we are, uh, and, and I can safely say that we, we are developing one of the most complex developments that uh, uh, Mumbai would see, and we have a digital twin ready uh, of that with all clashes detected. Now imagine how, how great it is. Uh, uh, we, we actually are reducing the curve uh, by a few years, right? So uh, it's, it's, it's rapidly evolving and, and, and leadership has a huge role to play through this because there is where vision uh, that we heard from uh, both the gentlemen uh, really, really comes to play. Eventually, if you look uh, and, and JLL research uh, that we recently came up with, uh, suggest that um, out of the three technologies that is going to drive real estate in future, uh, AI and generative AI are going to be two of them. Today, if I look at AI-driven prop tech, uh, they are getting close to around uh, $600 million as investment uh, globally, right? Which by 2030 is, uh, uh, is kind of going to touch close to a billion dollars. And, and the way I have been seeing investments coming in PropTech in India, uh, I would say globally uh, and in India as well, uh, uh, we will reach this number globally much faster than India is close to around $300 million. And, and that's phenomenal. That this, is, this is where it is going to be. Sustainability today uh, is, is uh, every leadership agenda. And it is no longer uh, just a tick box. If uh, our clients, uh, when, when they used to select a space, uh, always used to have certifications included into a way of selecting uh, buildings. Today, uh, sustainability is at the top of uh, the selection criteria that they would have, and it is just not uh, certifications, right? It is, it is clearly evolving. Uh, carbon credits are a big part of it. Energy efficiency is a huge uh, uh, topic around it. So not only sustainability has a seat uh, in the boardroom and in the exec, uh, but eventually uh, if we do not drive uh, uh, this agenda the way we have been committing to it uh, and it is not implemented, we will see a huge shift of workforce which is really getting quite uh, 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 aware of the way uh, uh, the environmental changes and some of the social changes that are happening, uh, we will see a huge shift of them away from, uh, away from our respective countries. Great. So these are some of the agendas which are, which are very, very critical uh, Thank you. from that perspective. Thank you so much, Aditya, for sharing this. And ladies and gentlemen, our panelists are from diverse industries. We first heard from logistics, then we went to retail and apparel, and then real estate. And now let's come to hospitality. Uh, Parveen, my question to you. How has, be, has been the leadership in hospitality industry adapting to the changing needs of consumer? Uh, you know, the world is changing and consumers changes uh, very fast. Uh, so how is the leadership adapting uh, in hospitality industry? So um, hospitality industry is going through its own uh, challenges and disruptions. So one thing that's happening is that 
with social media and uh, with so much of connectivity, most of the travel today is published travel, which means I just don't travel for myself. I want the world to know what's happening. And that's completely changed the way we operate and the way people are traveling today. So first thing which has happened is that the different kinds of cohorts of people which have evolved in the last couple of years. So let's say if um, about 10 years back you had about 100 cohorts of people who would travel into hotels, today probably it's, it's grown 10 times. So everybody has their own needs, there are different kinds of people, there are different reasons why they're traveling, there are different, uh, um, you know, purpose of travel. The same pers person travels five times in a year with different kinds of uh, expression and what they want. Now that's putting a lot of um, pressure and also creating a lot of opportunities for hotels. So what's really, what's, what's really that uh, happening to us? So one, um, there's a lot of opportunities for bespoke travel. There is a lot of branding opportunities happening, which means there are newer brands of hotels that are evolving. So if you look at today, most of the hotel companies have at least about 30 to 40 brands and every year they keep adding one or two brands. So that's going to continue to change. Uh, that means the consumer is becoming pretty diverse and individualistic. Second thing is that there's a lot happening with respect to digital. So even in our industry, digital is a, a great disruptor. And we are, we are using digital to address the first uh, change, which means that today we, we are focusing not on physical service, rather we focus on digital service, which means you use digital to fulfill and provide the knowledge to your people in the front, and they are able to give you the physical service uh, with the knowledge and insights that they would have. The third thing that's happening in our industry is that we are going through, quite like everybody else, a large challenge with respect to people. So that means we need to focus a lot more on talent and, and grooming the talent for your organization with the kind of uh, expansion that's happening. That's one of the key challenges that's coming our way. And the fourth uh, challenge that I would say or, or an opportunity is uh, sustainability because that's again kind of coming and knocking at our door. Um, so now if I articulate that into what are our leadership imperatives or leadership um, behaviors that are required to address that in the hospitality industry, I think the number one is uh, you need to be agile. Okay, we heard agile with other panelists also. Agility is very important because specifically in the distribution channel spaces, um, the way our consumers are changing, if hotels don't uh, adopt themselves, um, you know, very quickly you could become irrelevant. For example, we saw about 10 years back how Airbnb came and became a, a big challenge in our industry, similar to uh, consolidators like OEO and so on. So I think uh, making sure that you keep, be agile, keep an eye on what is the next big disruptor that's going to come your way and change yourself. That's the first leadership behavior that you need. Second thing is um, uh, being purpose-driven or responsible business, I think that's a very important aspect. In fact, we just launched our 2000, uh, we just launched our new Accelerate 2030 strategy. And uh, when we did that, our vision statement has been saying that we will drive purposeful change and take charge and shape the future. Now, pioneering purposeful change uh, was one of the most important aspects that we built in because we realize that as a Tata company, we are anyway very much connected to the society. But there is a need to put that as part of, uh, you know, your core DNA. Profits are not enough. You also need to give back to the society. You need to be responsible in terms of what you do. I think that's the second aspect as far as leadership is concerned. And the third thing uh, is that we all have to become uh, very uh, employee oriented and change the way we, be, we behave or the way we kind of conduct ourselves because today when you have most of your uh, people who come and work for you are generation uh, you know gen z and generation alpha you need to be a far more agile you need to have a lot more um, openness to change and you need to provide and make your work systems which are yeah, which which answer their questions than just doing what you want to do thank you thank you so much Parveen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the second phase uh, of the panel discussion. Uh, and the section is one of my favorites because it's around culture. As we all know, uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right? Uh, so, uh, and it's one of, one of the key levers for uh, driving growth as well uh, in the next growth era. So, I come to you, Belfer, with, with that question, you know. Uh, as you know, the country is growing fast, 
people, customers' expectations are changing very, very fast. Uh, they're evolving needs. So what kind of uh, leadership strategies you deploy to keep uh, your teams focused uh, in when it comes to meeting the needs, changing needs, evolving needs of those customers? Yeah, thank you. So <clears throat> our buzzword, by the way, on people is people service profits. PSP, people take care of people, they will serve the customer, that will bring us profits. So uh, coming back to your question, uh, you said culture, etc. Uh, it's very, very important to develop a customer-centric culture. We have something called CCC, and not insanely customer-centric. It used to be insanely, but now uh, CCC. But just to say to what level we will go, uh, I talked about vision earlier, but that was all specific to customer. Yeah, in 1996, we decided to fly aircrafts to carry courier material. 1996. We are the only cargo airline uh, that survived, and we are the only full cargo airline carrying uh, blue dart material and no other material in those aircrafts. Large aircraft, 757s, and just for the customer to become a last in, first out deal. So one of my uh, customers who want to send something at eight o'clock in the night, I still deliver uh, next day morning in the other parts of the globe. So when Gift Cities uh, came up, we set up a program. So if anybody's uh, there in Gift City, Ahmedabad, we said 20 hours into Gift City, we will deliver. And I give 18 hours today. In 18 hours from any major metro, I deliver, we deliver in Gift City because we saw a big vision there and we wanted to support the uh, people there. But coming to your question, uh, cultivating a very continuous learning uh, organization is very important uh, with, you know, encouraging curiosity, et cetera, leveraging technology to take customer-centric decisions very fast. That's the other one. I'm just rushing a little bit. Empowering decision-making uh, at all levels, if you want to be uh, customer-oriented. Uh, and the other one is, you know, a customer-centric leadership. It's all top-down. It's all top-down. A customer-centric uh, leadership that focuses on long-term relationship rather than transactional with the customers is very critical. But before I go, uh, we award every single customer. I know there's hotel industry and others sitting here. So we've got something called, you do a small customer event and there's an appreciation. There's something called Bravo Blue Dart, which is about 2,500, no questions asked. But if you do a great job and it's a super job, there's a super data. That's a 10,000 and there is no limit. You can send, you can award 10,000 people every month. So that's developing customer centricity in the organization. And I again repeat, it's top down. If the leader believes customer centric, everybody's a customer service officer. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Balfour. And in the interest of time, uh, we'll move towards the third track. Uh, so we've, we've talked about uh, adaptiveness, we've talked about cult culture, and uh, we now get to the shaping a vision for sustainable growth, right? Uh, and, you know, I would request Sanjay and Aditya, both of you, to just take a minute to explain, uh, you know, your vision around that. Uh, but the question goes like this. Uh, with consistently shifting consumer preferences, uh, how do you see leadership evolving in the apparel industry and vis-a-vis -vis real, uh, real estate industry to stay ahead of trends, right? Uh, and what role does innovation play in driving your respective organization's long-term success? So on real estate, I'll let my friend Aditya speak. <laughs> uh, so I'll talk about apparel. Uh, you know, before I come to adapting to changes, and so let's, let me take a minute to talk about the changes that are happening in the apparel sector. You know, the social commerce that we talk about, the e-commerce or the Zeptos of the world, the revenue that is getting generated from social commerce is about 1.2 trillion US dollars. And it is expected to grow 32% year over year and should be crossing $6 trillion in about four or five years from now. And there is another interesting statistics. The sale of 
pre-owned clothing, you know, the dress, the jacket that I'm wearing, today that resale is about $200 billion. Today's youngster wants to reflaunt the dress they have, and that market should grow 20% to about $350 billion. This is the changing dynamics that you really got to cope up to these existing dynamics. The other thing that is changing is the geopolitical shift. Now, because the reason the geopolitical shift matters to me because PDS is an Indian multinational. You know, so Africa gets a duty-free access to US for sales, you know, and then when you talk about China, there are these tensions that are prevailing between US and China. So therefore, one is using China for raw material, but processing in Cambodia and Vietnam, that's happening as well. Latin America is a favorite of US to let goods come inside them. India is prominent in cotton. So therefore, as a leader, you are, you are kind of coping up with so many changes that are happening around you. In fact, there is one more thing, there's a change in sourcing model. The retailer wants to only focus on the front end. How can I cater Mr. Jain better and let the back end be handled by somebody else? So in this entire scenario, when I'm doing a services company, agility, adaptiveness, enabling my people to take decisions. Now, very specific to India. I have to work out a customized culture. You know, there's an overall culture of 60 principles that I have, customer dependency, you know, currency dependency. But India, for example, I need youngsters to work in the company. I need smart people to work in the company. Every smart youngster want to be an entrepreneur now. They want to create wealth. There is a high aspiration index. Can I inside create an environment of they having the freedom to work? They believe I am able to create an impact. My incentive is linked like that. So I believe these are some very, A, embracing the overall change, B, working out a customized solution around the cultural aspect of the individual country. These probably are, lastly to sum up, when an employee is rated in PDS, the rating is 1A, 1B or 1C. One is the performance rating, A, B or C is, A is if you're 100% in conformity with the culture core values. So it's a dual rating that is actually, you know, leading to the incentive uh, formulation. Thank you, and, and, and looking at the timer, I'll, I'll keep it very, very quick uh, on my views. And uh, I think that's why we say that uh, change is the only constant, right? But uh, what has really happened is the timing towards this change has rapidly increased. So today, uh, uh, what we used to design a workspace, uh, uh, maybe a, a set for 50 years, maybe a workplace for anywhere between a 10 to 15 years, that is rapidly evolving. Now, now uh, flight to quality is real, right? And, and the good part is that we, uh, as real estate, we cross, uh, uh, kind of cut across all sectors and segments. And hence, uh, this flight to quality uh, with regards to talent uh, uh, and um, uh, both attracting as well as retaining as a workforce is going to be extremely critical. So four things, I think, as, as the future of uh, uh, workplace and workforce, I think workplaces uh, which, which includes uh, hospitality and all the other classes, they will be experience enhancers. And, and that would be important. Uh, similarly, uh, efficiency enablers, uh, uh, tech uh, adapters, and eventually sustainability partners. I think that's, that's how I would sum it up. Great. Thank you so much, Aditya. And that brings me to my last question, and that's for you, Praveen. Uh, sustainability is a key focus in today's business world, right? Uh, in the context of the hospitality industry, uh, what role does leadership play in ensuring sustainable growth of the organization? So, um, as I uh, discussed earlier, that pioneering responsible change is one of our key parts in the, in the core values. Um, so, in terms of sustainable growth, you need to focus not just on profitability, you also need to focus on the overall society. Um, and I'll try to divide this into two quick points. One is, uh, in terms of sustainability, we have, uh, we have a program called Pathya, which was launched about three years back. And uh, we focus heavily on various aspects of the society, right from making sure that we give back to the environment, 
to how we, um, you know, we have, we have a special function in terms of how do we do skilling. In fact, uh, we are going to skill about 100,000 youth till 2030. And these are not people who will come back and work with us. We actually release them to the industry. We're currently running 37 skilling centers to make sure that we are able to do that. We also focus heavily on uh, sustainable, um, you know, procurement, which needs to be done with respect to uh, you, you have to get things from closer to where you are and, and you are able to kind of reduce the carbon footprint. We focus on sustainability in terms of our responsible uh, growth, the way we operate on. Um, we also follow a very strict code of conduct which, which flows from the Tata code of conduct. So everything that, do, that we do has a social impact which is uh, kind of calculated. So overall, um, we being 120 year old and the first um, registered data company, we've, we've always been sustainable. And uh, it's important for us to kind of always give back to the society. And one of the core reasons for you being in existence is not just to make profits, but also to kind of uh, take care of the environment and the society. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Parveen. And uh, that kind of brings us uh, to the conclusion of this panel. Uh, thank you so much. Really appreciate your point of view, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for the patient listening.